from where you sit. Well, many thanks for joining us for another scintillating episode of The Trading Bell. This week on the program, we shall be speaking to the CEO of Isuzu East Africa, and that is Rita Kavashe, who will be speaking to us on the automobile industry in Kenya and what it has to offer even for the region. But really, who is Rita? Let's take a look at her profile. Rita Kavashe is the managing director of General Motors East Africa, Rita received her bachelor's degree in education from Moy University in 1991 and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Nairobi in 2005. Her career began in GM in 1995 in its East African operations, where she has worked for the last 21 years. During this time, she has been exposed to critical aspects of the business operation. After a series of moves with increased responsibility, she was appointed the Sales and Marketing Director in April of 2006 and then Commercial Director in September 2008. During this time, sales in the region grew by more than 30%. In 2009, Rita was nominated to undertake a developmental assignment in South Africa for six months to develop an export strategy for GM Sub-Sahara Africa. In 2010, her role was expanded with dual responsibility as Managing Director for GM East Africa and Exports Director for GM Sub-Sahara Africa. Rita also serves on a number of government committees and has played a leading role in the manufacturing, roads and infrastructure sectors with keen interest in quality and safety. Thank you so much, Rita, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Abby. Such a pleasure being uh, hosted one more time at your facility. You're very welcome. It's been two years since I was here, and I could see the great changes even as I drove in. A lot of uh, orders coming in, I must presume. That's true. Uh, quite a bit of uh, business is beginning to, to pick up, uh, driven mainly by the stability after the handshake. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are seeing a growth compared to last year when we closed. Our industry is looking up. We are looking at closing the market at about 12,000 vehicles this year compared to about 11,000 last year. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, interesting dynamics uh, are beginning to show. All right. Mm -hmm. And Arita, looking at uh, where we are as a country, mm -hmm. the one of the key pillars that uh, the government is pushing for is mm -hmm. the manufacturing agenda. And uh, we've seen a lot of uh, interest, especially from the local assemblers. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, there's been a lot of also opposition from guys who are importing finished cars. Yes. Uh, where do you sit in this whole conversation? And can we achieve full local assembly as a country? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, the country at onset, at independence, mm. uh, identified manufacturing as a key pillar of growth. And that is how companies like uh, Isuzu, uh, then General Motors, came into, into the country to form partnerships with government. As you may be aware, our company is co-owned between uh, Isuzu Motors Limited of Japan mm. and the government of Kenya as well as Centum Investment. So in terms of opportunity for manufacturing, uh, East Africa, Kenya as a regional manufacturing hub is, is still is still there, there's still great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Looking only at our sector, we have capacity right now to assemble 34,000 trucks. We are assembling uh, only 6,000 trucks per 34, annum. 34,000, that's like three times. Three times, that is just the capacity that is installed today. Mm. Uh, we are importing about 15,000 trucks uh, into the market. That tells you that today, uh, Kenya is able to assemble our total need of trucks. We are barely operating at about 20% uh, of the installed capacity of three assembly plants that we have in Kenya. Uh, we have our plant here in East Africa, we have AVA in Mombasa, and we have a KVM in Thika. Mm. Fully uh, ready to go. Okay. And uh, Rita, I'm quite convinced that uh, we as a country can achieve this, but 
What is the environment like doing business in the manufacturing space? You've been in this industry for quite a number of years and of course uh, some say Kenya has been making great strides when you look at the ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. At the same time we are seeing a lot of challenges in terms of cost of energy, cost of labor. Uh, cost of energy is, 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 is a big challenge in any country that is looking to uh, mm -hmm. uh, industrialize, especially heavy users of energy when you look at uh, heavy manufacturing like cement sector, uh, textile sector and all that require quite a bit of energy. Mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, manufacturing is not a short term, quick gain type of uh, engagement. It, it, it's long term. Uh, as I've mentioned, we've been here for the longest haul mm. and we have been in the country as we went through different seasons of growth yeah we still strongly believe that uh, manufacturing is the way to go and uh, the the pillar of manufacturing uh, is, is a very critical pillar when it comes to enabling the rest of the pillars uh, to be to have impact and to take effect Job creation is, is, is a big opportunity that we have in manufacturing. When we scale up manufacturing in my industry alone, if we increase production from 6,000 vehicles to 18,000 vehicles, you can see the dynamics that will come there as far as job creation uh, is concerned. So when the, you have increased uh, production, then you are, your cost uh, of production also reduce, and therefore your products become more affordable uh, to the end users, to the customers, uh, and enables other um, value chain mm -hmm. manufacturing to start to take place. Looking at our sector, you, we manufacture the chassis, but there's a whole supply chain behind that it. is behind it that yes. is manufacturing a lot more products. Mm -hmm. you, we have manufacturing of bodies, we have manufacturing of tires, we have manufacturing of automotive seats, wiring, harness. So one manufacturing uh, uh, sector can create outstanding level of, of jobs. So that's why we really must drive manufacturing yeah, in Kenya. All right. Mm. And as we drive manufacturing in Kenya, um, what is your feeling right now in terms of what do we need to address so that we can give this industry the kick it deserves and we can compete with our neighboring countries like Egypt, South Africa, mm -hmm. To get to the level where we're saying even owning a car will be so affordable as we speak if I want to buy a D-Max right now mm -hmm. Rita I can barely afford it you know and this is the common situation we are seeing with a majority of Kenyan farmers mm -hmm. who would like to carry their produce properly to the market but affordability no that is very that is very very true and the uh, policy uh, steady government policy is, is very critical to spur manufacturing, attract investors who will come with new technology, new skills uh, to support competitiveness mm. in manufacturing itself. Uh, and for instance, in our sector, we are right now in the process of uh, coming up with an automotive policy. Can you imagine uh, companies like mine have been investing in the country mm -hmm. purely on, on good faith basis? Yes. That, uh, we think we are okay. Mm -hmm. But if we have a policy, then more companies that are looking to set their hub, Kenya, to manufacture, will then be able to come. South Africa, Egypt, they have very clear incentives that are embedded in policy. Mm -hmm. Policy without incentive that is not attractive in itself but if there's a clear policy it's i like that it's mm -hmm. going to take uh, five this policy is valid for a period of 10 years these are the very clear incentive then someone is able to uh, do the maths and say is it worth for me to go and invest in kenya or to take my investments uh, in another region so that that a policy is very key uh uh, cost of cost of power is again as we've mentioned is, is very very critical for a manufacturer availability of labor uh, unions Kenya is, is, is very lucky because we do not have uh, high union activity yes. because when you're in manufacturing then you have workers who belong to unions and if those unions are striking every day that also can 
uh, prevent an investor from coming in country. So those are some of the key variables they look at. Is, is labor available? Mm -hmm. What is the cost of doing business uh, in that country? Is, the po is there political stability for me to take my investment into a country? Are there policies that are enabling me that are long term, that are not based on political cycle, depending on who is in power, what policy will that uh, leadership uh, regime uh, bring to a country? So those are very key fundamental issues that investors look for. And in Kenya, as I can see today, we are beginning to get into that space where there are clear policies, where there is attractiveness uh, of a country as a regional hub. And yes, we, we just need to scale up and, and, and make it a reality. All right. Yeah. And uh, making it a reality is one thing that many Kenyans would like to experience and be part of. Mm -hmm. But as we speak, Rita, there's been the interest rate cap. I don't know, how has this impacted on sales from an industry perspective, not just Isuzu East Africa? Because you also sit on CAPSA board. So, yes, uh, majority of uh, our customers and the, the drivers of business in our country largely remain as the SME group. And that is the group that uh, requires a lot of bank financing to be able to trade. So yes, uh, the interest cap has uh, reduced the amount of money that the SMEs are getting from banks. Uh, so banks are lending more to government because government is also requiring quite a bit of that money that borrowing is much more secure compared to, to SME. Mm -hmm. That is one, that is one big fundamental. And uh, uh, there is now new dynamics that are coming as we engage with banks, what else can we do? But for me, I think the most fundamental impact has been uh, in the area of uh, payments. Uh, SMEs are not getting paid on time so they are not able to really turn around their business and, and, and scale up. There is still some funding that is available, not enough, but to me the core of the slowdown, especially in, in different sectors, is payment and government not engaging in developmental projects. All right. When there are developmental projects in the, in the, in the country, then there is some good economic activity going on and there is money available for people to, to borrow. All right, Rita, as you sip a glass of water, mm. my next question is about the future of manufacturing. We are seeing a lot of uh, robotics coming in to sort of make the process more effective, you know? And this has a big impact when it comes to the production capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you guys follow the Kaizen model, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the most used in the world, mm -hmm. especially for manufacturers. but should we be worried about the pace technology is coming with? We are seeing driverless cars. Mm. We are seeing uh, uh, environment-friendly cars that are really big on uh, uh, aspects that uh, we'll be catching up with as a continent. But some countries have already gone that route. As you look at your crystal ball, Rita, mm -hmm. what does the manufacturing industry going to look like, say, in the next five years? Uh, I think manufacturing in our side of the world, there is going to still be a balance between human labor and uh, some good level of automation. Uh, in 10 years' time, maybe the level of automation would have increased, mm. but I don't think we, we need to fear. Okay. Because the future of work, mm. there will be new sectors that will be emerging mm -hmm. that uh, will require human human labor. Yes. Uh, customer service, you cannot uh, completely uh, put that under automation. You need to some level of engagement. And what we are seeing, we are seeing some reversal in that space. Car pooling, car sharing it is a desire for man to connect. Uh, with, with other people. So even though there's going to be a high level of automation and mm -hmm. we should embrace that and, and we are lucky we are this side of the world where we can be able to observe and see the trends that are emerging and prepare to take advantage of, of, of the lessons that we will be learning as far as the automation and technology uh, is presenting to us. Uh, I am not worried. I am not fearful because I know there will be another role that, for instance, in our organization that we can deploy 
uh, our people to be. In fact, we are we are we are changing our philosophy altogether from uh, being a, a, an assembler only to a, a transport logistics partner. We are looking at ourselves offering more than just assembling the car and passing it over to someone else to sell to creating ourselves to be of much more value uh, to our customers. All right. Rita, as we wrap up this conversation, it would be unfair for me to end without asking you, how do you juggle between family, work, and still emerge as this iron lady who is running one of the most successful companies in Eastern Central Africa? Uh, What's the secret? <laughs> Interesting. Uh -huh. uh, over the years, I have learned uh, not to separate my life from my work because then you start to conflict. My life and my work are seamless, completely integrated. So I have learned and I educate my co workers and, and, and other women that I engage with in different forums that you cannot really separate the two. Mm. Let them be one and the same. And how we drive this is, is, is through policy, uh, employment policy. How do we enable employees, both men and women, to be able to work and also attend to their family issues as part and parcel of work, completely integrating the two so that there is no conflict. I need to do this. If there's a family pressing issue, that my employee has to attend to or I have to attend to, then I have that space to be able to do so. If I need to work from home, we talked about technology, there's technology. I don't really have to sit in my office mm. to do my work. I can work remotely, I can work from anywhere. And I encourage my employees, if you have a pressing issue uh, that you need to address, don't come to the physical office. You can operate from anywhere as you solve your, your family issues. That's very empowering. Mm, very empowering Keep up indeed. the good work. Keep Thank up the you. good work. And uh, of course, uh, we look forward to seeing a, a stronger local manufacturing component in what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Well, we've been speaking there to Rita Kavashe, the CEO at Isuzu East Africa. And she is quite passionate about this industry, as you've heard it from her. And uh, she's quite optimistic as well in terms of where Kenya can be when it comes to the automobile industry. For now, we want to take a quick break and take a look at the market analysis for this week. Most investors are now uh, looking at their portfolios and uh, just uh, strategizing on the next move. Uh, we've seen that, we saw that a number of companies gave profit to earnings. Over 15 companies gave profit to earnings. So definitely, we are seeing sellout from all these companies. Well, that sound signifies the close of trading for today. And it's time for us to take a look at how the markets closed on this particular day. And we're joined by Elizabeth Wangeshi from NIC Securities. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for hosting me. Well, Elizabeth, a lot of activity from the banking stocks this mm -hmm. week. We are seeing a, a very interesting move, especially yes. with NIC Bank and CBA. Yeah. They recently got approvals from shareholders. What does this mean for the stock moving forward? Uh, I think right now, um, first of all, uh, we now all approvals from CBA and uh, NSC shareholders. I think now the remaining part is now waiting for approvals from mm -hmm. the regulators across different countries. So the bank definitely continues to operate um, as a standalone. Uh, right. So with the expectation that uh, the transaction will be closed by 30th June. 
All right, this will yes. make NICCBA the third largest, the largest privately bank. owned bank. Yes. And of course, uh, this domain has been dominated by KCB, Equity Bank. What are the fortunes for the banking sector in totality? I think uh, the direction that you're seeing uh, the banking sector heading to is a more consolidation. Uh, we've seen today's news of uh, KCB acquiring uh, NBK shares. Sure. So we expect to see a lot of banks, especially the tier three banks, uh, being um, acquired or other banks merging across All across right. the sector. So there's a lot of positive energy with the banking stocks. Does it mean mm. uh, we are likely to see more acquisitions and mergers? Definitely. I think it's in the offing. Uh, with uh, now we have a lot of um, a large number of uh, mini banks across the sector. Mm -hmm. So, and looking at our population definitely. And uh, when you look at uh, now, the margins have been shrinking over the time, mm -hmm. uh, cost, um, cost efficiency, NPLs also have been rising. So it would really make sense uh, for consolidation, having uh, less and lesser banks. All right. Yeah. And uh, Elizabeth, I know we can engage day in, day out about the banks, mm -hmm. but let's shift gears a bit now and talk about the NSC performance. This week, the NSC 20 has a, has been a bit edgy, if you ask me. Yes. And uh, I'm seeing today it's closing at 2,918.81 points. It's down by 1.67%. What could be some of the dynamics facing the market? I think there are a number of factors that we've been seeing uh, uh, with now the close of uh, financial results yeah. announcement. So most investors are now uh, looking at their portfolios and uh, just uh, strategizing on the next move. Uh, we've seen that, we saw that a number of companies gave profit earnings. Over 15 companies gave profit earnings. So definitely we are seeing sellout from all these companies. So, but we've seen uh, again um, interesting uh, move, uh, more investment in the banking company, uh, ban banking sectors, uh, Telco, East Africa Breweries, and uh, a few select companies. So yes. are you saying it's the best time to buy a banking stock? I would say selectively. Selectively. Yes. Looking at the strategies mm -hmm. the, uh, the bank is implementing and also looking at uh, is it the best time to buy looking at where it's trading at in terms of the multiples. All right. Yes. Let's look at the top movers this week and mm -hmm. I'm seeing KCB again. It's up by 4.061 million shares. And of course, KCB is among the banks that uh, is very aggressive when it comes to r expansion within the region. Yes. The r right mm -hmm. now, they, they are working pretty hard to have a presence in Ethiopia. So, uh, yes, so KCB, I think, uh, being the top mover this week, uh, it was really uh, being propped up because of today's uh, trade mm -hmm. uh, with the announcement of uh, the acquisition of. Uh, NBK. Yeah. So we saw a lot of activity and interest from uh, from investors. So expansion for KCB is a key uh, a key strategy for them, so that they look at more revenue streams. So because the top line is really shrinking. Mm -hmm. So the other aspect is now more of expansion, uh, looking for new partnerships across different markets and just growing the non-funded income. All right, and yeah. I'm also seeing among top movers. EABL, East Africa Breweries, the stock has moved about half a million worth of shares. Yeah. And of course, uh, we are seeing the drought in the country, and this might affect harvests for sorghum farmers, barley farmers. What are the likely outcomes for this particular stock? Uh, I think uh, for EABL, uh, looking at the pricing currently, mm -hmm. it's very attractive. Uh, why I'm saying this is we saw how half year 19 results were. Yeah. So that's an indication that the full year 2019 results will really be strong. Uh, the other factor to look at is where the company is trading vis-a-vis -vis other uh, breweries companies mm -hmm. and looking at how their product mix and um, other markets like Tanzania and Uganda, they've been growing. Uh, Tanzania grew by over 20%, Uganda by 12% and Kenya by 12%. It's an indication that there is a lot more potential for uh, for EABL. So for the second half, we expect to see very strong performance. And okay. uh, that's why we're seeing investors uh, just accumulating more shares in the company. All right. Yeah. And uh, Elizabeth, uh, just as we wrap up, uh, how would you assess the markets for uh, 
an investor keen on jumping in at this point in time? Because I'm seeing a lot of uh, trades happening throughout mm -hmm. the week. We've seen uh, the turnover has also really shot up for the last few months. Uh, so right now the market, uh, I would say, as I said earlier, it's uh, more selective uh, companies looking at a specific company. All right. So uh, definitely the attractive counters, um, mm -hmm. the banking sector, uh, the tier one KCB equity corp, they're definitely very good companies looking at how they, they performed in F418 and the expectation. If you look across now other, other sectors that are not struggling, uh, we've seen... Um, EBL, I mentioned about it. We also have insurance um, companies. The insurance, uh, we saw a very uh, uh, slow growth uh, in the bottom line. So we don't expect to see much on that side. But I would say the market right now is very ripe. So mm -hmm. for investors who want to continue investing, they still, it's still an opportune time for them. All right. Thanks, yeah. Elizabeth. Uh, shooting from the hip and yes. saying it as it is. Thank you very much. Well, time for us to take a look at Markets 101 for this week. Well, time now for my favorite segment of the program, and it's time for Question on the Street. Today we are taking a question from a social media platform. We are getting a question from Tolbert, and this is what he is asking. What is the difference between a stock being halted and being suspended? Over to you, Elizabeth. Uh, when a stock is halted, it means that the stock will not trade uh, temporarily. It could be for a few hours or a few minutes. Uh, suspension means it's a definitely longer term and uh, they give direction as to when the stock will start trading. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for your very cogent answer there. Well, thank you. time for us to take a look at uh, the historical facts as we take you down memory lane. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Trading Bell. And of course, we wish you a happy Easter and stay safe. And of course, remember to spend wisely. I don't know if you have any parting shot for our viewers. Um, invest wisely and serve more. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Wangeshi from NIC Securities. Well, of course, uh, remember you can always engage with us on our social media handles appearing at the bottom end of the screen. And of course, feel free to tweet us. Well, that's all the time we had for here on the program. My name is Abi Agina. Let's do this same time next week. <laughs>